Good afternoon. Today's presentation is part of the Philosophy Department's multiple speaker series. Before we begin, I'd like to put in a plug for the next installment, which is next Friday, this time, this room. It's the Neurophilosophy Forum on Friday, October 17th at 3. And Michael Anderson will be joining us from Psychology, Franklin Marshall College, presenting Mining the Brain for a New Taxonomy of the Mind. So now, back to today. So we're delighted to have with us today Professor Kevin Gallier, who is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Professor Gallier studied at the University of Arizona and specializes in social and political philosophy and ethics. He has published on themes in public reason, political liberalism, and some figures from the history of political economy. This year, he also published with Rutledge a book, Liberal Politics and Public Faith, Beyond Separation. Some of the expenses of the speaker series for which Professor Vallier is a part have been defrayed by a grant from the Charles Koch Charitable Foundation. Professor Vallier's talk today is unusual for a philosophy talk. It's relevant. Now, as many of us might know, there has been renewed interest in the proper place of religion in liberal political moralities. Quite recently, for instance, some of you may have seen there was a rather heated exchange between Bill Maher and Ben Affleck about how and whether Islam belongs in democratic political discussions. And this is something that has challenged political liberals, particularly over the past 25 years or so. So here to help us with that issue is Professor Kevin Vallier, whose talk is titled, A Genuinely Liberal Approach to Religion in Democratic Politics. Please join me in welcoming Professor Vallier. I'd like to begin by thanking everyone who has helped out uh, just my having an absolutely wonderful time. Uh, the faculty and the students have been great, uh, supportive. Um, it's, it's just been a really nice environment, and I think that's all to your credit. So, uh, as Andrew alluded, I'm talking today on a hard topic, one where there is almost certainly much more heat than light, both in what people say and what people write. And I think that's all the more reason why we should try to approach these issues in a careful philosophical way. And I hope um, that the issues I talk to you about uh, today are done in that spirit. I'll be focusing on what is known as the liberal approach. And the term liberal has many meanings, um, so I thought I'd begin with a very, very rough gloss. The liberal attitude towards political philosophy and political institutions is the ultimate aim of preserving both the liberty of all persons and having them treated equally. The liberal approach to religion, which I think in some ways is thought to fall out of that, is more or less, and it depends on who it is, whether it's more or less, uh, a matter of at least some concern or worry about religion having a very prominent role in the public life of liberal democracies. The rough characterization of the view is something like this. Religion can play sometimes a constructive role, but its role should be at best auxiliary to shared or perhaps for some people even secular considerations. That we should, at least in some broad sense, privatize religious belief, keeping it out of the public political square. It depends on which person who self-identifies as liberal we talk to about how strong this view is, but I think it describes a clear poll of uh, liberal thought, and I think it is a poll that both liberals and anti-liberals uh, have focused on and sometimes defended. However, in my view, the best understanding of liberalism uh, does not really require much of any privatization at all. So I'll claim for liberalism, but as shown through uh, contemporary political theory and what is known as public reason liberalism, that liberalism does not require citizens to privatize their faith in politics. So I say this thesis up at the top of the page, hopefully you have one, that liberalism, especially on a public reason view, is said to require religious citizens to privatize their faith in politics, but only mainstream public reason views, I'll explain, are vulnerable to this criticism, not my preferred convergence alternative. Now, what I'd like to do, rather than just giving you a bunch of machinery for political liberalism, uh, more public reason liberalism, is to use it as a proxy for the liberal tradition, broadly speaking. Because I think there's a kind of ambiguity within public reason 
um, that's reflected in the history of liberal thought as a whole. So the way I'd like to begin is by saying some general things about how the liberal tradition understands its relationship to religion. And then I want to show that, that that sort of same line of thinking reproduces itself in contemporary liberal political theory. And then I'll present my view as an alternative. Now to understand the way that liberals typically understand their relationship to religion, it's good to begin with what we might call liberalism's creation myth. Now, like many myths, there may be some truth to this. In fact, I think there is quite a bit. But it is a simplification, and here's how it goes. 500 years ago, much of Western Europe was dominated by the Roman Catholic Church and by Roman Catholic monarchs. The basis of political legitimacy was in some sense based in God's will or God's nature, in part through his laying down natural law. And among those natural laws was the duty of the magistrate to promote true and upright religion. Now, for, for several centuries, uh, attempts at dissent um, had uh, fallen by the wayside. But uh, in three years, we'll have the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Chapel. And so we all know a little bit about what happened with the Protestant Reformation that follows. We begin to get open, deep, and inalimitable religious pluralism. Now, we got disagreement about religion, but what we didn't get disagreement about was the thought that it was the duty of the magistrate to promote true and upright religion. But now people disagree about what true and upright religion is, and so they disagree about which religion is to be enforced. And various religious conflicts led to various settlements uh, in various European countries and wars across Europe in the Thirty Years' War. So we had what was seen as a kind of theistic basis of political legitimacy, an understanding of the authority of the state. Uh, and then it becomes controversial, and in some cases, bloody. It was in this context that I think that uh, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke began to do a lot of their political thinking. Uh, both of them had been very sort of concerned, if not deeply disturbed, by the potential for religious disagreement to turn violent. And if you take a look at their works as a whole, it is remarkable how much both of them wrote of religion. With Locke, it's a little bit more obvious. Right? He wrote a letter on toleration. He had several debates about toleration. He thought about toleration a great deal. He was rather intolerant as a much younger man in some of his earlier essays. Um, but many people don't realize that over half of Leviathan is devoted to dealing with the proper role of Christianity in the Commonwealth. So both of these men were not just interested in the role of religion in politics. They were deeply concerned with it. And I understand their projects partly in that light. And here's a thought. I think one thing that Hobbes and Locke and many others wanted was a basis for political authority that was not sectarian, that was not based in something that was too controversial for us <coughs> to get agreement on. So what Hobbes and Locke did in their own writing was appeal, again, as was common to the natural law. But this time, the natural law would be something that all Protestants and Catholics could agree on. Whether you were Protestant or Catholic, you agreed that people ought to keep their promises and should keep their covenants made. And as a result, if we rooted political authority in agreement, then that would hopefully not be as controversial or sectarian as the promotion of true and upright religion. So I think one aim of their project was to find, and this will be key, an impartial justification of political power one that would not depend on the particular sectarian doctrines uh, which people were fighting about. And so this becomes, I think, the sort of framing key question of the liberal tradition as a whole, which is this. How can political authority be justified despite disagreement? Originally, it's a narrow range of theological disagreement, but as time goes on, the range of theological disagreement broadens, the range of philosophical disagreement broadens. Liberals continue to grapple and struggle with how to deal with deep and pervasive pluralism. But notice that this idea of an impartial justification is critically ambiguous. There are sort of two fundamental ways we might think about it. One way that we might call a shared reasons view holds that what an impartial justification consists in is people having the same arguments or the same reasons be compelling to all of them. Right? So the thought is that if we want an impartial justification for political order, we should appeal to shared reasons uh, and shared arguments. 
Another way, what we might call a diverse reasons view, says that as long as people have some argument that's valid from their own perspective, so long as they can converge from different perspectives on the same set of principles and political institutions, then that too is an impartial justification. Because the justification of power doesn't depend on the truth of any one of their views, it's multilateral, it's multi-perspectival. Now for whatever reason, from Locke on, the liberal tradition went in a very serious way with a shared reasons view. As Locke said of the umpire, he makes decisions, all private judgment is to be excluded, you know, public judgment. With Rousseau, this is very plain. And it's also clear in Rawls. So it's this shared reasons approach, I think, that became a dominant way of thinking about the project of offering an impartial justification for political power. Now, suppose that you think that's the way to impartially justify political institutions. What do you now to think of diverse reasons and diverse argumentation? Well, at the very least, you're going to be at least a little concerned. You think, these are not really the heart of political life. They're not, in any deep way, the, the primary substance of political debate, discussion, and legislation. And you might even get really hostile. You might think, this is dangerous, divisive, sectarian, authoritarian. And so perhaps you'll suggest that in some sense, these impulses, these diverse arguments and reasons, be in some sense removed from politics, privatized, kept to oneself. There are a lot of people who say that liberals support privatization because they're comprehensive secularists, because they hate religious people. I have no doubt that's true for at least someone, somewhere. But I think the broad hostility to religion and public life, the one that's principled, comes from something like this line of reasoning. A deep concern to preserve the freedom and equality of all, to base the justification of political power on partial considerations, and giving a shared reasons interpretation of what impartial justification consists in. Since religious reasons are diverse reasons in any pluralistic society, those religious reasons could play at best an auxiliary role in a society's deliberative and justificatory processes. Now, as you might imagine, some people don't like privatization, particularly people that are deeply religiously committed. And the thought, very roughly, um, is that privatization is in some way immoral. Now, there are, I think, sort of basically two different arguments to this effect. They've been around a long time. They've been given many variations. But they're really kind of two core considerations. The first, and I think the root one, is a kind of integrity objection. That if you're really genuinely religiously committed, you can't just segment off your religious views into one little corner of your life. That you're obligated by your own understanding of yourself and your duties to God to live out the fullest and most um, sort of religiously faithful life that you can. And I say God because the integrity objection is almost always leveled by theists and almost never leveled by non-theists. Um, so, forgive me if I'm a little monotheistic biased here. So the first thought is that there's some violation of citizens' uh, integrity going on. People's freedom of expression is limited. And that this is particularly ironic on the liberal theory, which is supposed to preserve the freedom of all. Another worry is related, and it says that since secular citizens <coughs> in practice tend to rely much more often on shared considerations, the burdens of liberal citizenship fall unequally on citizens of faith citizens of faith who carry the greater burden. And so liberal conceptions of privatization are unfair. I th there are many objections level, but I actually think the huge number of them reduced to one of the other objections. Uh, these are the core words. And we can talk about these objections in more detail, but let me just say something about the effect of them. So you have people that are liberal, call themselves liberal, that support freedom and equality. They have an understanding of the way to think about that that requires something on the order of privatization. And so, as a result, liberals appear illiberal to a great many people. And I think it's been one understandable, and there are many not, not very understandable um, or reasonable objections to liberal institutions and to uh, liberal politics. Um, but this has been one that it seemed to me very serious, a charge leveled against the liberals that they were being consistent that they were restricting freedom of expression for religious people, not for secular people, but they were placing burdens on people of faith. And it was taking these criticisms seriously that led me to write the articles on the work that would later become my book. So I'm a liberal who's very worried about liberals being illiberal. And as a result, I am worried about privatization. And I think that if we took, or had taken the road less traveled, the diverse reasons view, 
um, we would not have this problem. So, what I'd like to do now is to be much more specific. Instead of saying something very general, I'm going to give you uh, the sort of flesh and bones to my broad claim. We're following now all the way down to the late 80s and 1990s when John Rawls was writing the articles uh, that were later comprised his book, Political Liberalism, and the other political liberals at the time who began to develop an approach to religion and politics. Um, but before I outline that approach, I need to say something about the theory and what drives it. So the original problem I think, was a conflict between liberal politics and public faith. But the new problem is that there's a particular sort of disagreement that's worrisome. Not just any old disagreement, but, as Rawls said, reasonable disagreement. Or the challenge of reasonable pluralism. So reasonable people, Rawls said, deeply disagree about important matters in a free society. Just the free use of practical reason would lead people to deeply disagree about what was good, right, holy, true, and just. This was a fact of social life that runs so deep, it's one from which our theorizing about politics should begin. Now, Rawls uses the term reasonable in many ways, and that's very vexing um, sometimes. Um, but let's just have a very workable, sort of practical way of thinking about it. Um, to accept reasonable pluralism, a person should recognize that there are sincere, rational, well-informed people who deeply disagree with them about important matters and do so validly and non-culpably and even in a very respectable way. Reasonable people are people who also recognize that whatever rights have, they have them all the same, and so they have to treat their free and equal uh, fellow citizens who deeply disagree with them as equals. And here's the challenge posed by reasonable pluralism. If we're going to be equals, we need to find principles that we can all accept. So we have to find political principles that are compatible with the diverse reason of all. And this is the challenge I think that Rawls set himself up for, and the political or public reason liberals set themselves up for. So the new solution is the distillation of social contract liberalism that's hundreds of years old into its modern form, public reason liberalism. Public reason adds to a traditional defense of liberal institutions a constraint on the use of state power. And it goes something, and very roughly like this, coercion is legitimate when it is justified to every reasonable point of view. So the thought is that we combine the case for liberal institutions with a constraint on state course of power that says it must be the subject of a multilateral, multi-perspectival justification, or at least a justification that can be adopted from multiple perspectives. Now, why does anyone adopt this constraint? Well, I can't go into a lot of detail, but here's the rough, generic argument that's given. The public reason constraint is grounded in respect for persons and recognizing citizens as free and equal. And public reason liberals claim that respect requires justifying coercion to others by their own lives. And here's the, the sort of the rough way I understand the idea. We recognize, you and I, let's say, that we're free and equal, but we also recognize that coercion is required for political life. So how is it possible for us to coerce each other and maintain the fact that we're free and equal? Because coercion raises a question. Someone is coercing somebody else. It looks like they may be dominating or oppressing them. So how could it be that we could use coercion in a way that is freedom and equality preserving. The public reason the liberal says this, if the person coerced is coerced in accordance with a rule that they themselves can adopt, or that they can, or that they do accept, or something along those lines, then by coercing them, you're merely requiring that they comply with principles they already know, or recognize, or find reasonable. And in that way, I can coerce you without dominating you and preserving freedom and equality because I'm only insisting that you live up to your own commitments. Now maybe that's wrong, but I think that's what's at work in the ideas of self, one thing that's at work in the ideas of self-legislation, both for so and not, and something that Rawls is picking up on and many in the public reason tradition are picking up on. So I think that's the, the core heart of the reason to add this constraint to liberalism. And it can be really quite strenuous, right? It rules out, I think, a great deal of potential coercion. Now, there are many public reason views now. People have been working out views like this for 25 years. There are many versions. And it's still very big business in political philosophy. But what I'm going to do for the sake of the talk is give a very generic characterization of the public reason constraint. It won't perfectly fit everybody, but I think it will do for now. Public reason liberals distinguish themselves by adopting what I will call a public justification principle. 
and says this, a course of action C, perhaps a law or a constitutional amendment or a policy, is justified or morally permitted um, if and only if every member of the public P, that is, all those subject to the law and suitably idealized, have some conclusive that is sufficient and undefeated reason for to endorse C. Now, I explained a lot of these details along the way, um, but what's really going to matter for our purposes is R. I think specifying the level of coercion that needs to be justified, given that characterization of justificatory public are very important parts of public reason. But for our purposes, it's the conception of justificatory reasons or justificatory reasons that's going to prove critical. Now let me give you some terms and just ways that I use these terms, some of which are standard, some of which are non-standard. Let us say that a public justification is achieved when the PJP is satisfied. That's just how I'll use the term. And a public reason is any reason or are that can be permissibly used to justify coercion to the public. So it's, public, it's a public reason in the sense that it's used by members of the public to justify coercion. It's a public reason in the sense that it's used to justify coercion to the public. But there's a third sense in which it is I'm using things a bit non-standard. Sometimes people mean by a public reason a public reason that is had or shared by the public. Now, I think that's one way to think about what a public reason is. But I don't think that's itself the concept. So I'm understanding public reasons as essentially justificatory reasons in the process of justifying laws to the public. But whatever you think a justificatory reason is, here's what political liberals or public reason liberals agree on. The reasons that justify coercion just to claim about the reasons that justify coercion, are in some sense internal agent-relative reasons. Now, this isn't strictly a claim about the metaphysics of reasons. We have, for instance, external reasons that were internally accessible. We're trying to set, in many ways, metaphysical claims aside. The thought is rather a bit simpler and goes something like this. Suppose, for the sake of argument, that Roman Catholicism is a false religion. Now, do nuns have reason to keep their vows of poverty and chastity? Well, there's a certain sense in which they don't, because their religion is false. I think there's an equally obvious sense in which they do. They have a reason to keep their vows of poverty and chastity, because they believe that Roman Catholicism is true. It's those kind of internal agent relative reasons that are the currency of public justification. So that's, I think, the core idea of a justificatory reason. The heart, the, con the concept, uh, not the conception. But notice that the ambiguity I spoke of at the beginning of the talk reproduces itself right here. The justificatory reasons are ambiguous between diverse reasons, allowing diverse reasons, and shared reasons. We can have a view that restricts justificatory reasons to shared reasons, or one that also permits diverse reasons to enter into the process of public justification. The literature now calls consensus views the views that public or justificatory reasons must be shareable or accessible. It's essentially a bracketing strategy. We take the set of internal recognized reasons that people have, and we say a subset are the ones that can enter the process of the justification of laws and policies. But it turns out consensus standards themselves are a bit ambiguous, and these are not clearly distinguished in the literature very much. Um, it comes in roughly two grades, and I call, and have called elsewhere, accessibility requirements and shareability requirements. An accessibility requirement says that a reason is public or justificatory only when it can be evaluated by common evaluative standards. An example would be two people in a scientific subfield. They agree on data sets, they agree on methods, they have different theories, and they derive different kinds of arguments and rationales from those theories. Those aren't shared arguments or reasons, but they can be easily evaluated by others in accordance with common standards. The shareability requirement, on the other hand, is a good bit stronger. Shareability says that all suitably idealized citizens must have the reason in order for it to be able to enter the justificatory process. Now, I think there are at least 13 consensus standards in the literature in the last 25 years. Um, and I couldn't tell you all the sites now, but I think I have them in the book. There's a lot of standards. Um, when most people give generic characterizations of public reason, they talk about shareability. But I actually think most of the standards turn out to be accessibility requirements. That's why I think we're also to view as actually. But of course, I reject them all in favor of the road less traveled and the public reason literature, the convergence view, where with some important but minor restrictions that we can talk about, I have a whole paper working these out, um, that all rationally recognized reasons of this sort are public reasons. 
There's no accessibility or shareability requirement. They can all enter the justificatory process. Now, I'm going to say this several other times in the talk. I want to say it right here, right now. Just because I'm letting these weird, diverse reasons into public justification does not mean I'm letting them out. So, for instance, suppose I support a law for a completely idiosyncratic reason. And you have a completely different, but com still completely idiosyncratic reason to oppose it. In that case, neither of our reasons get to justify coercion. Your reason defeats my proposal. So just by letting religious reasons have an impact in public justification doesn't mean that I favor religiously based coercion. In fact, I'm very much opposed to it, and I think the convergence view is actually pretty good at resisting it. Uh, but remember, so I'm just sort of letting in religious reasons in the front door, not letting them out the back. So it's the convergence view I want to defend. But let's get back to religion more directly. One of the things that happens when public reason liberals settle on justificatory principles is they almost immediately and sometimes seamlessly apply them to deliberation. But of course, the standards or norms that should govern deliberation and the standards or norms that specify what a good justification for a law is are different things. And so there needs to be an argument that takes us from one to the other. These arguments are oftentimes unclear, um, in part because there's a tendency in the literature, it's partly to deliver Democrats' fault, of confusing the process of deliberation and the process of justification. Because there are deliberate Democrats who think they're the same thing. Though I think in rare cases do the most coherent version of their view turn out to identify. Not even Hobart. So once they adopt a consensus type view, they move quickly to what I'll call principles or doctrines of restraint. There are many principles of restraint in the literature. And they all go something like this, though they vary quite a bit. But this would be, good citizens should not offer or act upon non-public reasons. Now, I say good citizens because they're describing an ethic of citizenship. So these requirements are not legal at all. Sometimes they look like moral requirements, where if you violated them, you've done wrong, you've done wrong. Um, or sometimes they're phrased like ideals, things that people should try to live up to in general. Not offering or act upon non-public reasons depends on the context just about everybody you can in your home, you can in your church. Um, but it's when it comes to, say, the public sphere that things must be restricted. And some people, like Rawls, for instance, think that restraint is restricted to discussions about matters of constitutional essentials and basic justice. So like I said, there are lots of variations. But this is the core. This is the heart of the idea. And so again, we can see the very general thing I said about liberalism up front has reproduced itself in a very specific way in the present period. So public reason liberals frequently take consensus to imply restraint. If diverse reasons aren't justificatory, probably not the best thing for dialogue. And the arguments very frequently go something like this. And sometimes it's almost seamless, but I think it, they have at least three steps. <clears throat> There's some defense of a general idea of public reason or public justification, like a public justification principle. Typically, this is fleshed out in terms of some kind of consensus requirement, accessibility, shareability. Then this is quickly applied to public discourse. And so we get principles of restraint. So it's typically some kind of sort of three, three step argument. Now the critics claim that restraint violates the integrity of citizens of conviction in general, most of the time citizens of faith specifically, and, and runs afoul of fairness objection. The interesting thing, particularly if you read some of uh, Michael Perry's stuff and Nate Walterstorff's stuff, when they actually get into the epistemology of public reason, they seem to by and large accept the, the argument they just take the modus told. So they say, well, restraint's clearly objectionable. It must be something objectionable out of a consensus way of thinking about justificatory reasons. And so the doctrine of public reason is false or wrong. Now here's the key point of the talk, the heart of it. If you hear anything else, hear this. If we reject the consensus view, the entire debate breaks down. We've removed the middle term. A debate that has generated an enormous amount of literature can now have what I take to be an attractive, and I have to show you this, third way. I think this is promising enough to make it worth exploring, in my case worth adopting, um, but one step at a time. So before I get too far into defending it, I do want to try to show you that it matters. So we're on the second page now, the handout. 
I want to give an example of how my conversion to you and the consensus was different. Members of the old order Amish Mennonite Church. The Amish are the sort of harder, harder edged version of the Mennonites, and the old order Amish are the hardest edge of them all. They are exempt from paying Social Security taxes. Their original objection was based on their reading of Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 5, verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, he hath denied the faith. The thought is that when the government taxes you to provide for the elderly, they're usurping the function of caring for the elderly. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that this was a good objection, all things considered. Um, I'm not trying to tell you that it was even valid. Um, all of the, uh, well, valid from within their system of beliefs. And it's remarkable, actually, how much of a price they're willing to pay for this. Um, they're pacifists, remember, and so they decided not to even hire a lawyer because this would fail to turn the other cheek. However, some other Christian uh, organizers uh, protested for them, and in the 1965 Medicare bill, they were exempted. Now, on my view, convergence to you, the diverse, that is, religious reasons of the Amish enter into public justification. That is, their reasons can serve as defeater reasons for laws. Now, sometimes defeater reasons defeat the case for the laws at all. Sometimes it's just a defeater for those people, uh, justifying an exemption. I didn't have very much space in the book to say when I thought it went one way or the other. I hadn't entirely made up my mind, but I have a paper, I think I have made up my mind, about when, how you go one way or the other. But I think that given, I mean, remember what they're saying. If any provide out for his own, he has denied the faith. Okay? So this is very, very serious for the Amish. Okay? It's not, this is not just a sort of a minor thing. Caring for their elderly is part of living out the gospel. And I think that turns out to be a very, very weighty, diverse reason. And I think that reason is strong enough uh, to defeat the state's reasons to coerce the Amish to pay taxes given their long-term practice of caring for their elderly. But on the consensus view, the reason derived from 1 Timothy 5.8 is not a public reason. It is neither shareable nor is it accessible. The common evaluative standards required to have accessibility are not met. Not only are they using the Bible, they're using a particular interpretation of the Bible. So it doesn't satisfy accessibility requirement, and if that's the case, it most certainly does not satisfy the shareability requirement. So that reason does not affect whether the law applies to them. But perhaps there's another way to get the exemption. Consensus theorist says, oh, but we think that freedom of religion is justified on shared reason ground. And we can use that reason to perhaps justify the exemption for the Amish. And I think there are two problems here. One, I think this blanket freedom of religion reason uh, does fail to take, in a very important sense, the Amish's reason seriously. They're not just appealing to freedom of religion. They're appealing to it under a particular description, which is their particular conviction about what the Social Security taxes and the Social Security system does. I think it's also the case that consensus type reasons are sufficiently vague that they give us a very vague right of freedom of religion um, that I think the convergence view gives us uh, something that's better defined and more extensive. But again, I want to say, diverse, that is religious reasons in this case, cannot justify course of laws that others have sufficient reason to reject. So again, the way my view actually sorts out, i repeat this, is that religion helps count towards the defeat of laws. It can either count as one of several supports for a law, but it can almost never justify coercion all by itself. In any society, there's a sufficient number of secular people. It's very hard to see how a religious reason by itself could justify much of any law at all. So I just have to make, make that clear. So that's one way I think they differ. And I think there are a number of cases like this. <clears throat> For instance, I think on consensus views, it's hard to get... Um, oh, never mind. I'm not going to talk about how that would, that would derail things quickly. Um, too new, too new. That's why I talk about the Amish. They're innocuous. Um, <clears throat> well, unless you're right here. Um, they're innocuous. All right, so why convergence? Why would we go with the convergence view? We can't just go with it, I think, because it uh, resolves the religion and politics debate. There might be good reasons to be consensus uh, theorists, and if that's the case, then I think um, that maybe we just have to have the religion and politics debate and insist, insist the consensus liberals win. So we need independent reason to adopt the convergence view over the consensus view, and here's a way to do it. We look at the fundamental values that lead people to be public reason liberals in the first place, 
public reason part of the liberal part. And then we try to argue that it vindicates the convergence understanding of justification over the consensus understanding. So if we take values that the consensus liberals themselves are committed to, and we show that convergence is better on those values, then we would have a good argument for convergence for public reason liberals. It's a very, very simple argument in strategy. Take people's commitments, show they lead away from their specific commitments. Take their generic commitments, show they lead away from their specific commitments. Here are two core values of public reason that I make a great deal out of. Respect for integrity, individual liberty, and conscience, and freedom of expression. They're all kind of a bundle of things. They're something that all liberals care about. And another thing that's very important, respect for diversity, reasonable disagreements, reasonable pluralism. That's another core liberal commitment. Both of these core commitments are bases of liberalisms that are not public reason liberalisms, but they're also the basis of public reason liberalisms. And I think on both of these values, convergence does better than consensus. On integrity, freedom of expression, convergence opposes very, very little on it, as it undermines most principles of restraint. Nearly all of them. So I think it does better on integrity uh, and individual liberty. Now on diversity, Diverse reasons are allowed to be justificatory. And I think this counts as more respect for reasonable pluralism because it allows us to take people as sources of reasons as a whole, rather than just saying, I'm only going to listen or accept or, or be sensitive to this tiny shared part. Of course, we can't take everybody's reasons into account because some of them are quite bizarre. Um, but, um, but I think we should err on the side of being uh, more open. So I think both on integrity and diversity considerations, convergence does better. And those are the two big lines of argument I run in the book. Uh, and there's a lot of detail, but that's the really basic sketch of why I think the convergence use better. Now, I said that I think the convergence use better, and I've also said that I'm in the minority. In fact, the small minority. So why is it the case that there are so many consensus theorists? I puzzled it over. I'm not entirely sure why, um, but here is my best guess and my best sense from the argument. One thing that liberals want to preserve from less or from more ambitious understandings of politics, some trying to realize the value of the community, is that we want to in some sense preserve the idea of people reasoning from a common point of view, having a shared project. So consensus embodies the idea of reasoning from a common point of view. I think that's the heart. That's why people want to be consensus theorists. They want to realize this, this communal good. Now, the arguments for why consensus best realizes this, um, I, I think they fall roughly into two categories. Um, there are actually some people, they, this seems to be what Josh Cohen thinks, this going back and forth with John, but it seems John Kwong, it seems to be what he thinks um, from his writing. There seems a lot of, there are a lot of people, and I've got even, even this in referee reports, where the consensus view is just entailed by a commitment to public justification. Because public justification just is justification on shared terms. Right? So sometimes people say about convergence articles, this isn't even a public reason. It's just pretending to be a public reason. Right? So people think if you commit to the ideal of public justification, that just implies a consensus. Other views are a little less conceptual and a bit more empirical, though oftentimes these claims are made at a, a, a level of sufficiently ideal theory that it would be a little bit odd to call them empirical claims. There's something more like claims about how our ideal of, ideal of a well-ordered society would tend to and the thought is that the consensus view helps to realize substantive values of community and fraternity. So if we allow diverse reasons into the story, a well-ordered society is not going to realize these goods as well. Now, I don't, I don't buy either of these arguments. I spent a lot of time on them in the book. Um, and many of the early arguments for these, these um, the, the ones that I think set the stage, were motivated uh, by conversational analogies. Um, Charles Longmore's made uh, a something of this. It goes roughly like this. I think there's a certain intuitiveness to it. If you and I are arguing about politics, and we have really different perspectives, and we can't settle on anything, and as Lorimer says, we should retreat to neutral ground. As we should start, if we really are interested in treating each other as free and equal, we ought to appeal to reasons that everyone can accept or appreciate or share, something like that. If we insist on our sectarian reasons, we're basically insisting that their reason conform to our reason, even when they fought it through. Uh, and there's something that is illiberal about that. Now, these conversational analogies, I think, um, are singularly uncreative. Imagine the following. You're a representative, and there's a bill that you support. It's 
very important. There are people in the other party, and they support the bill too, but for completely different reasons. They haven't quite seen this yet. They're not quite convinced. So you go to them, and you do what Rawls calls reason by conjecture. You say, these are not my reasons, but as I understand your view, your view seems to support this bill as well. Let's work together. Is that a failure to realize community? Is that, a, is that even a subpar realization of political community? Um, for me, it's hard to see. And of course, Rawls himself allows for reasoning by conjecture, though he says we must be rather careful about it. I don't think we have to be very careful about it. Um, so I think, I think the, the, the use of reasons in politics, and whether it's respectful, is highly contextual. So I think it's very difficult to get very much out of the passages that try to motivate the consensus here. Uh, I think the, con the entailment, I think, doesn't work. I think convergence shows, just in virtue of being a coherent account of public justification, that a no entailment claim is going to go through. Um, but I think the bigger killer is actually the ambiguity within consensus standards themselves. But everyone says, oh, I'm committed to public justification. And then they have all of these different requirements. Um, some of which are really very different from the others. It's not like they're all kind of roughly the same. There's a lot of differences. Um, and so I think just by reflecting on the ideal of public reason, we're not by, our, by that just committed to a particular consensus account. <clears throat> the other issue uh, that I have, I think, is that while community and fraternity are valuable things, I think it's hard, to, if, if you think the convergence is a better realization of liberal values, I mean, it's hard to see why these community and fraternity values are overriding. And even if you think that they could be overriding, I think it isn't obvious that convergence realizes them that much less, um, um, less well, or, or at least not that much. Right? You restrict discourse to shared reasons, and perhaps people will tend to appeal to shared values. But if you allow, say, people from diverse communities, particularly historically marginalized communities, um, that have particular discourses um, that they've developed on their own terms, that when you invite them in, however they've learned to reason, that that is realizing a kind of community of fraternity as well. So I don't, just don't think it's obvious that the shared reasons approach is the best realization of community and fraternity. So I also thought I would say something about two common objections to convergence, um, and then I will close. These objections are interesting because they're kind of the opposite of each other. So sometimes people will say to me, ah, well, in the convergence view, there'll be so many defeaters for laws that we won't be able to publicly justify much of anything at all. And there are two grades in this objection. One is an anarchist objection, which says, oh, you're not going to be able to justify really anything that we need. And the other is a libertarian objection. that says we're not going to be able to justify much of anything beyond a minimal state. So diverse reasons may defeat many shared norms. Doing so may threaten the possibility of a justified policy. Now, I think that the first thing to recognize in public reason is that the justification of claims is comparative. That we're comparing having a law to, say, having no law at all. And if you're really an anarchy, I mean, and what we're, the anarchy we're talking about here is really having no law. So what you have to say in order to get the anarchist objection to work is that there are some people who really prefer having no law on anything to having even a basic legal framework. I think the only... The only people who really accept this are people who would say it's either my way or the highway. That is, uh, someone that is really properly called a fanatic, but I use it in more of a masky sense. Um, someone who sh is so intent on getting their particular view that they're willing to just burn the whole thing to the ground. I think these people count as unreasonable. Don't think we have to worry uh, about accommodating all of their demands. It doesn't mean they have any fewer rights. It doesn't mean that, or anything like that. It just means that those demands are ones we can ignore. The libertarian objection is more complicated, um, but I think that it is resisted by the recognition that a system of private property is itself coercive and requires public justification. Um, once you bring out that claim, the idea that the default is the libertarianism is undermined. So I don't think the libertarian objection works very well either. Um, and... If people do think that, well, you know, I don't really like your laws, but I guess it's better to have some laws than none. Um, suppose we just can't agree our disagreement's interminable. Um, we don't have to conclude that the laws are defeated, right? Instead, we can conclude that I have my ranking of laws and you have yours, and we can appeal to publicly justified decision procedures to select among those options. 
Now, some people have the reverse attitude. They say, oh, with convergence, there's so many things in the mix. How would we ever settle on anything? There's too much indeterminacy. The high numbers of convergence points look problematic. And justice may appear relativistic. Now, I think the first thing is the public justification principle will rule out a great many norms and laws. So if there's some relativism here, I don't think it's very unpalatable. And if the problem is about making clear decisions, I think that's part the large function of political processes in the first place, of settling the things that we can't settle in the abstract. So that's really the stuff of politics. And so we focus much more on the justification of political processes, constitutional structures, that say the traditional royalty approach of focusing very heavily up front on getting clear principles of justice. So we can appeal to decision procedures here. We appeal to social processes. And I think both problems also could potentially apply to consensus that people haven't often run this. You might think, for instance, if convergence gives us too many points, consensus might give us too few, um, or vice versa. So I don't think consensus gets off the hook, though, of course, I'm glad to say more about that as well. So my conclusion is that convergence liberalism is the truest liberalism. It's a superior conception of justificatory reasons on its own terms. It better because it better respects the integrity of citizens of faith and the diversity they represent. It has the additional bonus feature that it saves liberalism from the appearance of hostility to the people of faith, in at least a great many cases. There are some people who insist that many religious citizens would not be satisfied with a convergence. You know, in some ways, I think that's right, but whatever they're not satisfied with, it won't be on the basis of the integrity or fairness of the be basis of something else. Convergence also opens the door to diverse dialogue, which I think was one of its nicest features. I think there's a kind of homogenizing impact of the shared reason view that we want to avoid. While keeping it closed to the things I think liberals really ought to be worried about, which is faith-based coercion. I, mean, I think that's really the problem. I mean, that's really the issue, is the faith-based violence um, of, of a sort of sectarian. That's, that's what we've got to worry about. So I suggest that we reject consensus liberalism what I believe to be the genuinely liberal alternative emergence. Thank you.